The difference between landscape planning and design can be explained with a simple analogy. Think about going on holiday. You do the planning first, then you do the design, then you buy some tickets and set off. Likewise, for a landscape architecture project. You do the planning first, then you do the design, then you specify the construction and start work. Now for a slightly longer account. It's from a book I wrote on landscape planning and environmental impact design. The preface explains that planning projects tend to be larger in scale, longer in duration, inclusive of several land uses, more concerned with public goods than private goods, and more to do with function than aesthetics. The book has two parts. Part one was about plans for areas of land, such as geographical zones and administrative regions. This activity tends to be called spatial planning in continental Europe, physical planning in the UK, urban and regional planning in America, and development planning in developing countries. Part two of the book dealt with development projects and the relationship between land owners' interests, which tend to be single objective, and those of the wider community, which tend to be multi-objective. So, there were chapters on public open space, reservoirs, minerals, agriculture, forestry, rivers and floods, transport and urbanisation. Forestry is a good example. Naturally, woods and forests are beautiful, biodiverse and productive. Plantation forestry, however, is normally practised as ugly monoculture. So there's a need for environmental impact design and landscape architects, led by Frederick Law Olmsted and Gifford Pinchot in America and by Jellico, Colvin and Crow in Britain, gave their attention to other issues, recreation, scenic quality, wildlife, water management, etc. Planning for other land uses had similar trajectories in the 20th century. But what happened too often is that the environmental assessment process squandered time and money. After a lengthy assessment procedure, projects were either permitted or refused. Much money was spent too few benefits were achieved. Environmental assessment became a bonanza for scientists and, for conservationists, a way of delaying and stopping development projects. Some of them needed to be stopped, but others didn't. My argument in part two of the book was that more attention should be given to environmental impact design to EID, as well as mitigating the endless negative impacts of human use on the natural environment, projects should be planned with generosity and imagination to yield positive impacts on the stock of public goods and to contribute to community objectives. The land uses discussed in the book were seen to be at different points on the long journey from single objective projects to multi-objective project planning. The people and themes underlying my approach are clearer to me now than when the book was published. Here's a short summary of them. 1. The belief that landscape architecture has a special concern with public goods comes from Gilbert Lang Meeson, who, in the first book on landscape architecture, quoted from a letter to Sir Walter Scott that 
the public at large has a claim over the architecture of a country. It is common property. Two, the interest in preparing forward-looking plans for green open space comes from John Claudius Loudon and Frederick Law Olmsted. Loudon proposed concentric breathing zones to be created round London as it grew. We call them green belts. Olmsted created what Laurie Olin, a, a famous landscape architect, described as the greatest work of art in America, Central Park in New York City. Three, the belief that we should plan for people to enjoy the benefits of both town life and country life comes from Ebenezer Howard and was illustrated with his inspiring Three Magnets diagram. Four, the belief that single objective projects should be replanned as multi-objective projects comes from Patrick Geddes and Ian McHark. Geddes wrote, for example, that drains are for cities, not cities for drains. He meant not for cities as opportunities to build drains. Five. The emphasis on systematic project-by-project project environmental impact assessment and planning comes from Ian McHarg and was first used in his project for the Richmond Parkway. The technical development of McHarg's overlay method into GIS and geodesign comes from another two landscape architects, Jack Dangermond and Carl Steinitz. The term collective landscape, which brings these themes together, is from Geoffrey Jellicoe. It appears on the cover of The Landscape of Man and derives from Carl Gustav Jung's work on the collective unconscious. Jellicoe wrote that it is only in the present century that the collective landscape has emerged as a social necessity. I regret that Jellicoe didn't make more use of the term collective landscape and I regret that I haven't either. But I did use it, thinking about him, in the preface to landscape planning. I didn't mention him because I thought my use was slightly different. And I've also mentioned Jellicoe's interest in the word collective in two YouTube videos. One is an illustrated version of the preface to the book on landscape planning, and the other compares Jellicoe's interest in the collective unconscious with that of a now very famous public intellectual, Jordan Peterson. I'll finish this podcast and video with another question, prompted by a photograph of a place with bad planning and bad design. Here's the question. If you were compelled to make a choice, would you rather have a place that was well designed and badly planned, or a place that was well planned and badly designed? Answers welcome as comments below the YouTube video.